As you will have seen from various reflections this winter, someone who has a close relationship with spiritual science will need to make his ideas so far as they flow from spiritual scientific insights ever more tangible and real or in other words connect these ideas with ever more specific and complete realities. In speaking of the in some senses benevolent spiritual powers of the various hierarchies we know that certain beings of these diverse hierarchies remain behind at a former stage and therefore do not unfold the activity they would have done if they had advanced. Instead, the activity they develop is one that would correspond to a former stage of the evolution of the cosmos. On a large scale, therefore, we can identify Luciferic and Aramonic beings who today engage in activity that normally progressing beings once engaged in during the old moon stage. From many different perspectives, we have described the significance for the whole cosmos and its evolution of the fact that such Luciferic Aramonic beings and powers are interwoven with this evolution. Now, in a more intimate circle, we must really accustom ourselves to discerning these Luciferic and Aramonic elements. But to do so correctly, we must shape our feeling world correspondingly. For if, as many amongst us unfortunately still do, we immediately feel, in response to Lucifer and Araman, that we must keep them safely at one remove from us, keep them at a distance, this will, of course, always lead to excessive unease and anxiety whenever we speak of Lucifer and Araman in this more intimate context. And yet to fully understand world phenomena as we need to if we are to meet life with understanding, we should certainly become able to perceive Luciferic and Aramonic attributes in this smaller circle. You see, my dear friends, centuries before the mystery of Golgotha occurred, there was majesty and grandeur in the ancient teachings that emerged from India and were recorded in the Bhagavad Gita and in other oriental scriptures. At the time this was something great and mighty, of huge significance. You will be able to see from the lecture cycle on the Bhagavad Gita given in Helsingfors, Helsinki, that our spiritual science in no way seeks to diminish the grandeur and majesty of such things. There, indeed, I pointed to the great and profound truths contained in the Bhagavad Gita. For modern humankind, it is a very good thing to immerse oneself in this way in something that was of huge importance and significance at that time. But then came the mystery of Golgotha upon humanity. And only through this, in fact, do we gain a really historical view of Earth's evolution? Because if we understand it rightly, we can then distinguish between the time that preceded this mystery and prepared for it and the era that followed it. The Orient does not actually have these concepts of evolution at all, of historical development, since it cannot gain any real understanding of the mystery of Golgotha. As far as the Orient is concerned, there is only a generally valid truth for all times, rather than any evolution of the truth. Now, in our time, a great many people find it difficult to conceive of the evolution of knowledge. This is because we have not yet fully imbued ourselves with the meaning of the mystery of Golgotha. If we assume, therefore, that someone in our time wished to speak in roughly the same way as the author of the Bhagavad Gita spoke, or the Buddha in his time, this would mean that he was seeking to do something that was right for an era centuries before the mystery of Golgotha. 
and it could therefore be said that the person in question would have been acting rightly if he had done this at the time the Bhagavad Gita emerged, and this would at that time have been a right and proper deed in accordance with evolution. But if he appears today and speaks in the same manner and sense in which the Bhagavad Gita was written, he is carrying into our own time something that ought to have been developed back then, and therefore his whole way of thinking would extinguish everything that has arisen in evolution since that time. In fact, I am not speaking here in the abstract, but wish to refer you to something very specific. In 1912, a book was published entitled The High Goal of Knowledge, Aranada Upanishad, by Omar al-Rashid Bey. Let me expressly mention that Omar al-Rashid Bey is not from the Orient and has nothing to do with Mohammedanism, but affiliated himself with it for purely external reasons. We will leave to one side here why he embraced this culture. In fact, he is a German and sought to do something you cannot do without joining Islam, which he therefore did. Omar al-Rashid Bey also became a Brahmin and wrote this book, The High Goal of Knowledge, Aranada Upanishad. His wife, Helena Bulal, published it after his death. Let me note here that I have nothing against the excellent tales and novellas that Helena Bilal wrote previously. There is no need to tar all of an author's works with the same brush. But the preface which Helena Bilal, now under her married name of Helena Bilal al-Rashid, wrote for this work by her husband, would have been better left unwritten. In The High Goal of Knowledge, published in 1912, we do really discover something that could legitimately have been written centuries before the mystery of Golgotha, and appearing now is therefore most eminently luciferic. A book by me, due to be published soon, contains many of the ideas I presented in public lectures over the previous two winters, but it will also highlight the distinction between the more modern outlook of idealism, which has fully comprehended its place in the world since the mystery of Golgotha, and the philosophy of ancient India. The book will show how the former has moved on from the latter. You see, my dear friends, the teachings of Fichte, Hegel, Schelling, and others I name there go far beyond what is contained in Oriental wisdom, in Brahmanism. People do not yet generally acknowledge this progress, this advance, for two reasons. The first of which is, as I describe in my book, that they generally find it difficult to concern themselves with these things. The second is that nowadays, once we have gained some knowledge, we have absolutely no talent for appearing lofty and noble to ourselves and others in the way the Oriental is capable of. You can read this book, The High Goal of Knowledge, Aranada Upanishad, from cover to cover, and you will find that it not only conveys knowledge that the author thinks should be acquired, but continually also adds that this is knowledge imparted by the highest masters of wisdom, and that such knowledge is very lofty, so much so that only chosen people can understand it. Yes, my dear friends, we need only consider how given the Orient's talent for veneration, someone like Fichte would have been revered, and you will see what we lack in the West. We do not have a gift for looking up to something of grandeur with the same underlying feelings with which the Oriental, for instance, gazes up to his Buddha or his Shankaracharya, but it is seductive, and here we can even say luciferically so, when someone speaks in this way. Firstly, we find it very appealing when someone writes a high goal of knowledge. That's quite a title, don't you think, and acts suggestively. Everyone will be eager to acquire such knowledge by reading the book's 173 pages. 
But apart from this, when the book expressly accentuates that this knowledge is being imparted by the wisest of the wise to you alone as worthy recipient, and you must therefore be an important person if you are receiving the knowledge preserved by these wisest of the wise, the feelings of incense-wreathed self-elevation can get out of hand, especially when such a book closes with these significant words, quote, Peace be with you, O worthy one. I have spoken to you of the final goal of knowledge, have said as much as it was fitting to your understanding to say, for earthly good and the redemption of the world, stammering words for a questing soul. From the plains, the first hills have been ascended, the mists are clearing. Before you now shine the heights of Hemavat. Open your eyes to the divine light, you see truly, and all earthly wisdom is shown to be worthless. The all-blinding nature of appearance has been swept aside. Maya is extinguished, a dream, and what awakens in you is greater than all worlds, attainment of the high goal of knowledge, attainment of perfection, perfection in the Godhead. Thus resounds the Adyaya in the Aranada Upanishad, awakening. The ultimate is wordless, nirvana. Close quote. The ultimate is wordless, and to accentuate this especially, Helena Berlau al Rashid tells us in her preface that we should take this wordlessness in its deepest sense. In her pupilship to the content of this book, she states that she now acknowledges that human words are inadequate to express the things of greatest profundity. In other words, of course, the book contains much profounder matter than it actually expresses. The wordless knowledge, to which ultimate appeal is made in the book, must naturally be especially profound. If one already considers what it states to be endlessly profound, what it does not say must be all the more so. And yet, my dear friends, it is one thing to write and think such a thing, and quite another to hold fast to it. The words themselves are not the ultimate wordless truth. But the book does start with a hugely profound vision, one rendered in a way that is fully in keeping with the ancient oriental mode of wisdom and utterance. Quote, if I stand here and another stands here, he stands to my left. I say truly that he stands to my left. But when another stands there, the same person stands to his right, and thus left and right are not absolute designations. If I define his position, I say left. When the other defines it, he says right, and so right and left are Maya. Close quote. Steiner again. How could one possibly give a better idea of Maya than to say left and right are only relative terms imposed from without? And the book continues with roughly this level of, in quotes, profundity, for its depth is primarily assured by continually stating that its statements are unfathomably deep. But the book raises itself to other matters, too. You may know and will easily realize, if you read the book I am soon to publish, that the thinkers who cultivated a modern philosophical idealism were primarily concerned to experience the I, capital, and to dwell within it. This is what is required since the mystery of Golgotha. But Oriental wisdom was concerned by contrast not only to experience the I, but also vanquish and extinguish it. And now Omar al-Rashid Bey, a German, not an Oriental, renews this ancient Indian wisdom by saying, quote, He who seeks salvation in the eye hearkens to the command of selfhood. Selfhood is his God. Close quote. Yes, my dear friends, apparently whoever seeks his salvation in the eye makes selfhood, self-seeking, his highest command and God. In fact, self-seeking, egoism, precedes discovery of the I. 
as long as we are still seeking the I, we develop selfishness, from which we are only liberated by finding the I. Once we have found it, we can no longer be tormented by self-seeking, by egoism. In discovery of the I lies the only true means to overcome self-seeking or selfishness. And today, after the mystery of Golgotha, anyone who still seeks to flee the I, who still says the kinds of thing that were said ages past in ancient India, is thrown back from the I into the search for the I, the obsession with it. Such a person, in particular, will cultivate egoism. This is why books of this kind make such a self-seeking impression on us today, strike us as addressed to those who withdraw from the world and do not wish to seek the immortal, spiritual heart of reality, who take flight from reality instead and selfishly seek knowledge in their dreams. This is a self-seeking knowledge, one which fails to discern its own nature and is therefore the worst selfishness of all. This is why the whole book is selfish and self-obsessed. As long as the I had not yet entered humanity's evolution, that is, prior to the mystery of Golgotha, the quest for the I was inevitably a lofty undertaking, and oriental wisdom was called for. To speak in this way today means seemingly to push the I away from you, while behind Lucifer takes a hold of you and really, properly, shoves you down into selfishness and you don't even notice. And then the book continues, quote, Whoever seeks his salvation in this world will succumb to it and remain in its clutches. Close quote. But since the mystery of Golgotha, we should say that whoever does not seek his salvation in the spiritual nature of the world, but instead takes fright and flees it, will succumb to the world even more. That is, he succumbs to the world that dreams in him. And then the author continues, quote, He will not escape by harboring unsatisfied longing. Close quote. He means that such a person will succumb again and again to unsatisfied longing. But the one who says this has succumbed to a longing for the I and does not notice this because he flees it. Quote, he will not escape through worthless play. Close quote. Instead of accepting reality, or instead of facing it and seeking within it for what is spiritual, flight is taken from it. And because of this, a person will fall back still more so into reality and fully succumb to it. Quote, he will not escape the tight chains of the eye, close quote. But the very finding of this eye is what enables us to wrest ourselves free of these chains. Quote, he who does not raise himself from this world of his will live and pass away with it. Close quote. But if we speak in accordance with the mystery of Golgotha, we will say this, quote, whoever binds himself to the eternal nature of this world and seeks the eternal within the temporal will not pass away with this world. Close quote. Almost every sentence in the book can be turned on its head to discover what is right for our time. I myself wrote in its margin, quote, He who flees the eye succumbs to obsession with it, for obsession with the eye makes the eye into an eye only for oneself. Finding the eye liberates one from Obsession with the I liberates us from selfishness. Close quote. The world is one through someone who penetrates the world with perception and understands it. The original says, quote, He who does not raise himself from this world of his will live and pass away with it. Close quote. Today, after the mystery of Golgotha, we say instead, quote, The world is won through someone who penetrates the world with perception and understands it. 
close quote. Thus you can see from this that what we call luciferic in a fully technical sense of the word also has its profound importance in our more immediate historical development. To propound as valid for our time something that was taught millennia ago means to teach a luciferic doctrine. Seers, though, who embrace reality, are all too easily ignored today because people do not consider it important enough to concern themselves with the content of their seership. Wisdom such as that entitled The High Goal of Knowledge very much addresses what we can call higher human selfishness. To concern oneself with reality, to understand and embrace it, is of less interest. Nor do we have much talent for acknowledging and esteeming those who do so when they live amongst us, as the Oriental of past ages acknowledged and revered his Buddha. Robert Hemmerling is one such figure, and in certain respects is indeed a seer or visionary, and the greatest modern poet of Central Europe. I do not wish to speak about Robert Hemmerling's poetry or philosophy in general here. You can read more about this in the book I referred to, which is soon to be published. I would just like to highlight how Hemmerling's gift of vision has proven its worth in a thorough perception of what is happening in the world today. He demonstrated his seership, his visionary gift, in a great satirical epic titled Homunculus that was published shortly before he died. What kind of poem is this? Well, I won't read it to you today. You can, of course, read it for yourself. I wish only to show how we can understand the idea of the homunculus, homunculism in modern terms. We have amongst us, I don't mean specifically here, but in society in general, and if they were here, then naturally those present would be exceptions, people who believe that the scientific mode of thinking is the only valid one and all our views should be founded on it, that everything must or can be explained in scientific terms. Accordingly, they reject everything that is either not explained or cannot be explained scientifically, regarding it as phantasm and dream, mysticism, occultism. Such people exist, of course, and they assume that everything is subject to mechanistic and material laws, including all mental and spiritual phenomena and experiences. They too are subject to material, mechanistic laws of matter and energy. Well, naturally, one can conceive such a thing, but the world as pictured by a materialistic thinker cannot be real, and in such a world even the smallest plant would not develop let alone an animal or human being. But still, we could ask what kind of a human being would arise if the world was as believed to be by those who acknowledge and admit only scientific ideas. What would such a person be like? He would, of course, have been engendered by a world of purely mechanistic laws, and there would be no mysteries involved. Hammerling answers this question with authentically artistic poetic power, presenting in his homunculus a person who would inevitably exist if there were only a materialistic world, a little man, an homunculus. And this homunculus achieves a good deal. If you recall various things I have said in recent lectures, you will see that the brain is in some respects a mechanical instrument and could arise from mere mechanisms. The brain could therefore engender cleverness. Such a person could be terribly clever and could place himself with extreme adroitness into this mechanistic world order. Hammerling's homunculus is very clever and well able to handle and combine all the things that arise in the world. He launches a global newspaper, which is possible, of course, in a world in which the homunculus thrives, where one can be a great newspaper magnet. The homunculus also becomes a billionaire, not just a millionaire, but a billionaire. That is also perfectly feasible, 
in a world devoid of spirit. Thus things continue. He founds a school for monkeys because, based on materialistic Darwinism, he naturally believes that human beings are descended from apes. And therefore, if you teach apes properly, give them formal schooling, they will naturally turn into human beings. Their evolutionary journey is shortened by this means. The section about the ape school in Hammerling's title, Homunculus, is really excellent. He also shows the position adopted by people such as journalists. All this can happen in a world of homunculism. We can really say that Hammerling wrote with visionary insight in the 80s of the last century. For naturally, there would also be airships in the homunculus world. Much better ones, perhaps, than we have so far, since our old views still hamper things somewhat or do so at least in the opinion of some. Hammerling's homunculus builds himself an airship. He was writing in the 80s, as I said. But unfortunately, when he sets out into the cosmos in it, he is caught up by the universe's powers of attraction, by cosmic gravity, and drawn by mechanical forces into space. And so, when you go out in the evening and look up very carefully, you may spot a tiny wreck in the far distance, and that is Homunculus on his shattered spaceship. He is still clinging to its last few spars, slowly merging with the mechanical forces. Hammerling's title Homunculus is founded on reality and is written with a real visionary gift. Of course, the world that the Homunculus imagines does not exist, but people can allow their thinking to conform to it, and at least for a while, for an era, can establish homunculistic thinking. In Hammerling's view, homunculism is making headway and taking hold of people. People cannot make nature soulless, for it retains its soul, but they can make themselves soulless. And homunculus, the man without a soul, also finds a soulless wife. His perception and knowledge to which soul and spirit find no entry make him a soulless man. Hammerling sensed that people would celebrate the idea that they had overcome Goethean classicism and everything connected with it. Goethean classicism still retains its complete faith in Homo sapiens, the knowing or wise human being who could discover within his mind and spirit something that can establish a human-scale society. Such people are certain that all human society is dependent on merely economic circumstances, that these condition and create human nature, and that therefore the old classicism that regarded the human being as homo sapiens is now outmoded. Hammerling sensed the advent of such an outlook. You may laugh at me for suggesting that anyone could be so misguided as to think that the old classicism, with its belief in Homo sapiens, might be dismissed as a thing of the past, and that increasingly people will believe in a Homo economicus instead. You might think it ridiculous that ideas and ideals will no longer be considered important in human society but that the latter will be governed only by mechanistic principles, by scientific and economic laws, in which homo economicus is but a cog in society's machine, and the dull-witted idea of homo sapiens has been consigned to oblivion. You may think that such a crazy idea cannot be thought intelligent, but let me relate to you, my dear friends, something I read a little while ago in the title Berliner Tageblatt, an article by an old friend, his name is Engelbert Pernerstorfer, who is now the vice president of the Austrian Imperial Council. In many respects, he is a very intelligent man. In this article, he was celebrating a book by a certain Dr. Renner, entitled Austria's Renewal. I had every reason to attend to this book since, in his review of it, my old friend Pernerstorfer 
said it was a work that all our contemporaries should pay heed to. He said it showed there were still people who know how the world should be organized once this war has ended, that people with very fruitful creative ideas still existed. Naturally, since one should keep abreast of developments, I ordered the book, and in it I read this, quote, Other forces have become visible in many ways in this war. Most notably, one sees how the economic maturity of nations testifies to their dominance. Hindenburg's victories were rightly called, quote, railway victories, close quote, since the good state of roads, railways, and routes in the country is a pledge of military success, albeit a sign only of more advanced economic organization. Close quote. Steiner again. Not to be disputed, but let us read on. Quote, the greatest re-evaluation brought about by this world war relates to our economic, social, political, and military assessments of industry and thus of the industrialized nation as such and its labor force. Here a real revolution has occurred in public awareness. And now comes the war, and high and low, here and abroad, the cry has gone out unceasingly and ultimately indisputably that the victory belongs to industry. Germany's industry has saved the fatherland and has proven itself the indestructible and irresistible impetus of the nation. The industrialized nation here conquers the trading state, the welfare state, and the agrarian state. Industry is the core of our nation. Only an industrialized nation can at one fell swoop turn cavalrymen to infantrymen, reservists to well-armed battalions, and home guardsmen into soldiers at the front. This is the achievement of an industrialized nation, whose workers must often in their lives change company, sector, and job, and repeatedly find their feet again in new circumstances, if the economy is not to founder. Close quote. Steiner again. The author writes that the prevailing ideas of a former time should no longer govern the social order, but instead we should be guided by science. This, with its mechanical laws, informs and organizes industry, and also incorporates the human being as a cog in the industrial machine. This apparently is the greatness of modern science and organization. Quote, Science and organization become living practice only in the industrial populace. From now on these experiences must inform and imbue our whole political practice. It is not by chance that in this war the idea of the state is proven to be more powerful than the principle of nationality. In the half century since the historical high point of the idea of pure nationalism, the world and human beings have undergone astonishing development. The predominant interests of those now distant decades were still literature, art, and philosophy. The classical age remained an influence. Technology and economy now dominate human imagination, and from being homo sapiens in the classical age, we have now become homo economicus. Economic interests predominate and overshadow everything else. And thus the modern state is regarded differently and accorded a different value as an economic state, both for its own members and in the eyes of outsiders. Its value lies in its economic function. Close quote. Steiner again. There we have it. That is what we have come to. Quote, technology and economy now dominate human imagination, and from being Homo sapiens in the classical age, we have now become Homo economicus. Economic interests predominate and overshadow everything else. Close quote, Steiner again. This is the book that was recommended as one of the most significant and radical new signs of modern thinking, as something we should pay full heed to if we wish to renew modern life. But what is it? homunculism. What Hammerling anticipated in the 80s of the last century has become a reality. Here we have homunculism as system, as philosophical worldview. 
homunculus not only becomes a billionaire, not only founds a global newspaper, but he also writes the book titled Austria's Renewal, political essays by Dr. Karl Renner, member of the Imperial Council. Hermelin was a visionary and saw what was coming. And what has come could find a remedy if it would look back to what Hermelin created in his title, Homunculus. Dr. Karl Renner, who probably lives in Vienna, need only go to Graz to discover that a certain Hemmerling lived three decades before him and predicted all this. It is important for us to understand why a creation such as this homunculus is such an achievement. It is outstanding because without possessing spiritual science, Hemmerling asked himself what a human being would be if he only had a physical body. Naturally, he did not specifically say this, but that is how he described his creation. In his homunculus we have a person who basically brings no legacy with him from old Saturn, old Sun and old Moon periods of evolution, but possesses only earthly evolution, thus lacking the core aspects of the I, capital, astral body and the etheric body. Hemmerling's homunculus can properly be understood by drawing on the science of the spirit. And so, my dear friends, it is important that we closely examine modern realities and developments. Last time I said that the idea of the mystery of Golgotha, as we know it from spiritual science, brings three things together. Firstly, the Zarathustra Jesus, as embodied in the Solomon Jesus child who brings what humanity has undergone through history, what he himself has undergone in passing from incarnation to incarnation. And then I described what the Nathan Jesus child brings, the nature of humankind predestined for the earth, but before it descended into incarnations and passed through historical development. I showed that the Quran fully acknowledges this Nathan Jesus child, including the fact that he spoke at the moment of birth. To these two elements we bring one, the third, Christ's non and super earthly nature, which enters the person of Jesus of Nazareth, the Solomon Nathan Jesus, in his thirtieth year. And thus we can recognize in the Christ a connection between worlds of spirit beyond the earth with what was accomplished on earth. At the same time, I highlighted the need for our age to acknowledge this grandeur of the figure of Jesus and thus also the grandeur of the mystery of Golgotha. Our time in its fifth post-Atlantean epoch has very greatly developed the power of reason, rational thinking, but this must be complemented by a spiritual comprehension of the world. And then people will understand the mystery of Golgotha again and do so in a more advanced way than was possible in preceding centuries. We must acquire the means to understand the mystery of Golgotha. But before this can happen fully, everything that our harmonic powers infuse into this view of humankind first emerges. Basically, all good spirits are waiting for human beings to understand the mystery of Golgotha. But everything as yet opposes this human endeavor. People do not wish to approach an understanding of this mystery of Golgotha and therefore unconsciously traduce it at the same time also unconsciously traducing the figure who must stand at the center of this mystery. If you imagine for a moment someone who really seeks to experience, to live through all the profound feelings, the serious feelings and sentiments that can be engendered in us through the manner in which we understand the mystery of Golgotha, and that he then encounters another who speaks of Christ Jesus as he is understood in modern culture, you may perhaps conceive how the first will experience the latter view as a terrible calumny and dismissal of what his real knowledge of the mystery of Golgotha enables him to feel. His interlocutor 
may object by saying that his understanding flies in the face of rationality, that he is crazy, that he can only believe such things because he is a crazy fantasist, and that only such a dreamer could make anything of the way in which the Gospels describe Jesus Christ. Someone might experience this, and if the person who raises such objections thinks himself a poet and has even written good poetry to some degree, and, lacking further matter for his poems, now also takes up the subject of Christ Jesus, he might well wish to portray this artistically. He might ask, quote, What is the real nature of someone today who absorbs what the Gospels have to say about Christ Jesus? Close quote. Yes, he must be a fantasist, a dreamer, somewhat weak-minded. A clever person, after all, someone at the center of our, quote, glorious cultural advances, close quote, will naturally regard the Gospels with a critical eye, will discover their contradictions, and realize that Jesus can only have been a good man who lived in Nazareth. A rational person, he will think, cannot possibly believe in what the Gospels contain, and so anyone who does must be weak-minded. Only someone who is weak-minded can think of following Jesus Christ. Someone at the forefront of our cultural progress cannot. A weak-minded fellow of this kind might, as described by the person who thinks himself advanced, go on his wanderings and arrive in some village, stand under a street light there and start preaching because he believes himself to be filled with the Spirit of Christ. And then, because he is seen as weak-minded, he might well be locked up. It is possible to imagine a situation in which a modern Christian is locked up for his beliefs. Then, let us imagine that he is interviewed by the local priest, who impresses on him that he must not preach about Christ because he is not a priest, and by a judge, who releases him finally after reading him the riot act. He is only an idiot, after all, and is allowed to go on his way. And so it goes on. He meets others who believe in his idiocy, and he finds he has the gift of healing, can heal them. You see, there is a belief nowadays that illness, not real illness, of course, can be cured if someone not quite in his right mind lays hands on those who seek this. The weak-minded fellow goes on growing more and more weak-minded and comes to believe, because everyone tells him that Christ really is present in him, that he is Christ. In this further tale, things take a turn for the worse, and he is misjudged and maligned. Well, you can imagine the dreadful kind of tale that might be written if someone who embraces contemporary cleverness decided to represent Christ in this way. But this has happened. Here is the book titled The Fool in Christ, Emmanuel Quint, a novel by Gerhard Hauptmann, and it contains what I have just briefly summarized. This is not to say that Hauptmann has not in the past written some fairly good plays and other things, but it is the nature of our time that someone regarded as the greatest poet of the age resorts to an account of Christ that depicts him as an idiot. I realize, of course, that a great many people will retort that my critique is due to religious or philosophical objections, and that I have failed to recognize the work's purely aesthetic value. In purely aesthetic terms, in fact, the book is a sorry effort. And rather than a poor imitation of Dostoevsky's titled The Brothers Karamazov, I would prefer to read Dostoevsky himself and would advise everyone else to do the same if that is the kind of thing they wish to read. Even small details of Hauptmann's book remind one of the brothers Karamazov, that this fool in Christ is accused of committing a murder. He is innocent and is released. He regards himself as Christ and wanders through the world, knocking on any door he cares to, priests, cardinals, bishops, and so on. He knocks on everyone's door because, naturally, he believes that all should accept the Christ. Everyone turns him away or throws him out because he is seen as a fool. And the book ends pathetically 
after a description of him knocking on the door of a former teacher. Quote, the same thing happened a few days later in the house of a teacher where Emmanuel Quint had once listened to Brother Nathaniel's penitential sermon. Close quote. Steiner again. The names are all allusions. Continue quote. The teacher's family were sitting at table while a cold autumn wind blustered in the darkness outside. A step was heard at the threshold, and then a knocking on the door. The teacher's wife did not wish to open the door, for she was afraid. With some anxiety himself, the pious teacher commended himself to the Lord, and opening the door a crack, asked, Who's there? Christ, came the quiet answer. With a force that made the whole house shake, the teacher slammed the door shut in the man's face. He returned, shaken, to his wife, and told her there was a madman outside. Close quote, Steiner again. And so it continues. The whole tale ends neatly as follows. Continue quote. One week later, the same nonsense again began to preoccupy the people of Frankfurt for a little while. In the intervening period, hundreds and hundreds of doors had been flung shut in the face of the fool and beggar who called himself Christ. A Frankfurt resident who viewed these events ironically and that with all the noise of slamming doors, the Lord in heaven must surely have noticed the goings-on amongst the human race. We should thank heaven. Close quote, Steiner again. And now comes the really outrageous passage. Continue quote. That this wanderer was only a poor earthly fool and not Christ himself. For otherwise hundreds of Catholic and Protestant priests laborers, officials, counselors, traders of all kind, general superintendents, bishops, nobles and citizens, in brief numerous pious Christians, would have burdened themselves with the curse of damnation. But how was anyone to know? Although we pray, quote, not to be led into temptation, close quote, whether, at the end of the day, it was not the true Savior who, in the guise of a fool, wished to see how his divine seed, the seed of his kingdom, was coming to fruition. Close quote, Steiner again. The back door is left open here to the possibility that Christ could have incarnated in the figure of the fool to see how things were progressing on earth. Naturally, Christ and the world of spirit is unable to do this, according to a man such as Gerhard Hauptmann, who is part of our glorious culture. Continue quote. In this case, Christ would have continued his wanderings, as we saw through Darmstadt, Karlsruhe, Heidelberg, Basel, Zurich, Lucerne to Gershenen and Andermatt, and would only have had door slamming in his face to report back to his Father in heaven. The last we heard of him, the fool who called himself Christ, was sharing bread and shelter for the night with two merciful Swiss shepherds. Since then, no one has seen him. Close quote. Steiner again, if you read the advertisements in the newspapers, which is an interesting thing to do after all, you may have seen a large announcement in most of them, spread over most of a whole page. The announcement came in various versions, but I will read you one of the many that have just been published. Quote, the paperback edition of the novel, The Fool in Christ, Emmanuel Quint, by Gerhard Hauptmann is now available, 540 pages paperback, 375 marks. It is easy to predict that this book will be reprinted countless times and translated into all the languages of the civilized world. It will gain fame as an authentic religious novel, one not only praised but avidly read for generations. It is no exaggeration to say this for the book is one of the of overwhelming power and worth. Its subject encompasses nothing less than the religious conflicts of our era portrayed in the form of a dreamer a son of the people, who credits himself with being the son of God. Every religious person will be edified and uplifted by this great avowal of our greatest living poet. Here Hauptmann has accomplished his finest work. Close quote. Steiner again. This review is not one written by the publisher himself, Samuel Fisher, but comes from the pen of a very clever gentleman writing for a newspaper in Berlin. You see, my dear friends, during the course of this winter I often found it necessary to speak of how spiritual science should render our thinking healthy, 
how it should shape our thought, forms of thought in the right way. It is symptomatic of our time that someone who says the Homo sapiens of classical times have been overcome and that Homo economicus must take his place is not regarded as crazy, as he should be, but as a cultural benefactor, as someone who, in the figure of the homunculus, Dr. Karl Renner, is now in a position to solve life's enigmas. But a great deal of work has been undertaken, my dear friends, a very great deal of work, to tempt humankind away from really healthy thinking in tune with reality. In the book by me that is shortly to appear, you will find a clear account of thinking in accord with reality. Today, we not only have the old title, Critique of Pure Reason by Immanuel Kant, which makes it clear that human beings cannot get near the, in quotes, thing in itself, that all is illusion, but we now also even have, as I have frequently mentioned, Fritz Mautner's title, Critique of Language. There are now ardent proponents of this critique of language, journalists especially who sing its praises and trumpet it abroad. Many now regard Mautner's work as a monumental contribution to modern philosophy, whereas in fact it is nothing but the most abject dilettantism. Mautner is not even capable of realizing that we do not think or picture things through words alone but that rather a word is like a signpost, a gesture pointing toward what it designates, both in the physical and the spiritual domain. Because Mautner has no inkling of the nature of language, he begins to criticize the word, believing that people created it and then simply adhere to words which are devoid of any underlying reality. But you see, we cannot criticize reality by attacking language. Let me illustrate this with a rather drastic example. Mautner has written three heavy tomes, not only his title Critique of Language, but also title A Dictionary of Philosophy in two thick volumes. There he collates, let us say, concepts of existence, knowledge, and so on, all treated in terms of each word itself and its derivation. Where the word originates, where it first appears, how it has been translated from one language to another. And he thinks that this will give us insight into the nature of reality. Here is the drastic example I wish to give you. Let us assume that Fritz Mautner is traveling through Austria and finds a phrase that originated there. Let us say, quote, Bohemian Privy Councillor, close quote. The expression Bohemian Privy Councillor is very common in Austria. Now, what would Mautner, in his critique of language, be obliged to do if he follows his own methodology? First he would start with the B in his Dictionary of Philosophy and would have to fully critique the concept Bohemia. Then he would look up the P and the C, analyzing the idea of the Privy Councillor, and in this way seeking to discover the nature of the reality of the Bohemian Privy Councillor. But in fact, in Austria, the Bohemian Privy Councillor need be neither a Bohemian nor a Privy Councillor. In fact, most Bohemian Privy Councillors there are neither Bohemian nor Privy Councillors. If they are a Privy Councillor, this is only accidental. And most of them are not, and they certainly do not need to come from Bohemia. It will be completely accidental if they do. In Austria, the phrase Bohemian Privy Councillor refers to a skulker with a gift for pushing his way forward to gain some advantage and elbowing others aside in the process. This has nothing to do with either Bohemian or Privy Councillor. He could be a registry officer born in Steiermark and yet still be a Bohemian Privy Councillor. Thus you can see that the way in which the word is formed points to a reality and all words develop in this way. If you seek the reality in words themselves, you will often find as little of it as one will find in Bohemian Privily Councillor in Austria if one does not probe further than the mere content of the words themselves to find what the phrase actually means. 
So you see, my dear friends, that we have reached this degree of confusion in our time, along with a very great dose of arrogance into the bargain, since the confusion is seen as innovative achievement. It really is not unimportant to know that works in which human imagination is poisoned in the way Gerhard Hauptmann does this in The Fool in Christ are going into paperback editions and being read in huge numbers. It really is not a matter of indifference if human thinking becomes as confused as it can be through a work such as this critique of language. We can see such things as the outpouring of an arrogant rationality that opposes any real comprehension of the mystery of Golgotha, which we so urgently need today. As Christ himself was crucified, the idea of Christ is now also being crucified in modern humanity and is being so through a book such as titled The Fool in Christ, Emmanuel Quint by Gerhard Hauptmann. Of course, Hauptmann thinks himself so clever because he shows that bishops, priests, officials, and so forth slammed the door in the fool Quint's face when he told them he was Christ. He even adds in elegiac mode that Christ might be present in this fool and these people would therefore have cast him out too when he came to see how the world was getting on. But my dear friends, if the real Christ had by way of a trial entered some human being and knocked at the door of Gerhard Hauptmann while he was writing his words of wisdom in The Fool in Christ, Hauptmann too would have slammed the door shut and thrown him out. A great many things prevent people today from approaching a threefold understanding of Christ. The historical Christ who entered the Christ figure through the soul of Zarathustra. The earthly Christ upon whom, however, earthly life had not yet exerted its influence, the Nathan Jesus child. And the third aspect for our understanding of Christ, the power which descended from spiritual heights and rendered all life on earth fruitful. This threefold understanding, my dear friends, is one we must seek to acquire. And it will be acquired if spiritual science penetrates all self-seeking and egotism, all the pride of those who, while saying that silence is the highest goal of knowledge, nevertheless chatter away about left and right and the one sometimes being the other and of those who want to found new social orders in the image of the homunculus and of those, too, who create blasphemy and worthless novels. If that is what they can be called about the fool in Christ. Despite all this, there will be human souls and minds who succeed in approaching an understanding of the threefold Christ.